Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm excited to welcome back our guests. If you've lived in Philadelphia, then no doubt you have your version of Sonia Sanchez. Sonia's was the first poetry reading I ever attended some 40 years ago, and I was amazed by the same fire and beauty then that continued to infuse and animate her singular voice. We don't have time to name Sonia's myriad achievements and honorifics, but I'll mention a few highlights, including her creation of one of the first Black Studies programs in the US, her leadership award from the Academy of American Poets, the prestigious Wallace Stevens Poetry Award, and the Frost Medal. When you buy your copy of the collected poems, you can read about her other achievements. You'll also hold in your hand more than six decades of poems by a poet about whom U.S. Poet Laureate Joy Harjo writes, her songs of destruction and loss scrape the heart. Her praise songs thunder and revitalize. We need these songs for our journey together into the next century. Tonight, Sonia will be in conversation with her former student, Amin Zadi Kita, poet in residence, associate professor, and co-coordinator of African American and Africana Studies at Ursinus College, and author of Brief Evidence of Heaven, Poems for the Life of Anna Murray Douglas. Sonia and Zadi, it's an honor to have you back. The screen is yours. Hi, everybody. Hi, Sister and Zadi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Sister Sonia. Yeah, so good seeing you, my dear sister. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to see you. Mm -hmm. So um, would you like to um, start us off with um, a litany? Of well, I'd like to uh, make a statement, all right, if okay. I might. Uh, um, a statement that uh, was sent to me uh, um, um, for the presenters, uh, you know, for the concerned Black workers of the Free Library uh, of Philadelphia. Um, and one of the things that it says in here that because um, many people had 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 uh, in a very real sense had uh, com no, completely agreed with what they were doing here uh, at the library uh, with all of their demands uh, that they did not do any readings and CBW just decided at some point that they still thought it was important for readers to come to Philadelphia. So they say, while CBW has been gratified by the outpouring of support by authors who stood in solidarity with us, we also recognize that further author cancellation will cause Black audiences to lose out on hearing crucial stories and knowledge that now have a more vital place than ever before. And cancellations will in particular hurt Black authors will forge opportunities for book sales, will forego opportunities for book sales and securing honorary for appearances. With this, in lieu of cancellations, presenters who wish to stand in solidarity with concerned Black workers might instead consider one or more of the following. And there are five, six things here, and I agreed with all of them, that I am in solidarity with the Black workers uh, here at the library. Uh, in Philadelphia. And, uh, and I would ask the audience also to say that, to, to write uh, to the mayor, to write to the library, to write to the board, saying that like, indeed you are in solidarity with concerned Black workers of the Free Library of Philadelphia, that nothing could happen here without them. We are so indebted to them for all the work that they do. So I just wanted to begin with saying that. Um, and we thank them for all the years that they have done uh, spectacular work here at the library. I want to begin with saying, um, you know, simply, you know, we are here because of George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis, mm -hmm, Rakia Board, Eric Garner, Renisha McBride, mm -hmm, Richard Hulse, Taisha Miller. Amadou Diallo, Diallo, Don, 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 Trey Hamilton, John Crawford, LeVar Jones, Tamir Rice, Remain Brisbon, Tony Robinson, John Bell. We are here, 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 we are here. I wanted 
to begin with um, naming some of the people you know, who had made transition uh, in a valid fashion here in America. And we just wanted to say simply that that certainly must also cease and stop here in America. And we wanted to remember them and have the audience listening to remember them also. Um, I think um, that at some particular point, we've got to begin to truly understand um, that we are making a long trek towards, in this country, towards saying simply, you know, we've got to begin to discuss what it means to walk upright as human beings. And certainly uh, that, has, that has always been the goal of many of the writers that I know that I am uh, involved with and have been involved with. So I want to begin um, um, with a piece that I did hear actually at the library uh, when Sister Toni Morrison came here to read. Um, you said we die, that may be the meaning of life but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. And my dear sister, Toni Morrison, how you do this thing called language, the measure of our lives, how you recapture our words, untangle this language, how you stand words up, let them minuet our blood, how you open up the sorcery of language, spitting teeth on the wonder of words, recapturing the wings of our most sacred vows. Listen, you say, summer is around the bend and you anoint our eyes with surprise, bring us into the flesh of rain and laughter called paradise, love, Sula, jazz, the bluest eye, song of Solomon, tar baby, beloved, a mercy, God help the child. We commandeer your words spinning under this domestic sky and they become a river moving against winter sails, repelling ice water ghosts, kneeling on razor thin knees at confession. Our bodies are tattooed forever with your quick civil tongue and we are one alive apart from the electricity of the dead. The day comes my dear sister breathing in your eyes of silk. And I remember your words, don't tell us what to believe, what to fear. Show us beliefs, wide skirt and the stitch that unravels fears cave. And I thank you for this prose stitch called home where men and women shipwrecked with flesh and disguise, graveyard memories settling in their feet, walk themselves back home in air as black as their smile. Their hearts still searching for gusts of life as they dress their limbs in starch bones and new memory I put on my eyes, my dear sister. I am in the eyelash of your memory where there is always a small miracle called home and Toni Morrison and home and Toni Morrison and home and the bluest eye and Toni Morrison and Toni Morrison and beloved and Toni Morrison. Ashe, thank you, Sister Sonia. Wow. Um, well, I want to stay with the question of our beloved sister, Toni Morrison, for a little bit. And now that she has joined that litany that you often deliver of warriors uh, who have uh, stood down conflict and offered mm -hmm. us ways to see the world, now that she has joined that list of ancestors, almost two years in, um, what can you say? Um, what should we What should we grasp about or understand about the gifts Toni Morrison left us in her body of work? Can I just maybe read a couple of things that I I, I wrote um, and um, for the film that um, was done on Sister Toni Morrison? I think, I think you saw it, didn't you? Um, yes, absolutely. The pieces that I am. The pieces that I am, right. When we honor Sister Toni Morrison, 
with this celebration, this documentary, we honor the national memory of a people, of a country. She helped to shape the spirit, voice, beauty, pain, joy, history, history of a country dominated by racism, slavery, homophobia, greed, assassinations. When we listen and read her, we see all of us, our ancestors, our sons and daughters, our parents and aunties and uncles and cousins and play mothers, our mothers and fathers, our sane cousins and our insane cousins, our Sididi ones, our outsiders, these those women ordained with wild noise also. They all come home and they all combine rather to teach us the lessons of our blood. I cannot imagine, I could never imagine being on the earth without the handprints and mouth prints of this genius woman. Picture her at an angle of light quivering in liquid language. And then, you know, I, one of the things I did because in the film responding to it, you know, there is a, a discussion of Blue's Eye, um, her first book. And I responded by saying, in some African societies, it is said that when the mother gives birth to twins, the first one comes out to check out the turf, comes out and say, okay, what's happening here? Okay, I'm looking around, who's out here? Who's waiting for us? You know, are they friendly? Are they unfriendly? So that first twin comes out and does that and to see if it's safe for the others to arrive. Uh, she, he is the scout and the bluest eye was the scout. The bluest eye came uh, and we all read it and the bluest eye said, okay, you read it, right? Tough book, wasn't it? Uh-huh. Uh, is it okay to bring the rest? Because we got a bunch, you know, we got a bunch coming out. We got uh, a Sula coming out next. What is it okay? And this is what, you know, uh, I, I thought that was important for people to understand that these books of hers are not just singular. You know, uh, this is this long trail, you know, of saying simply, you know, we are now going to begin a conversation about what it really means uh, to be a black person on this earth. So this book, uh, The Bluest Eye, came forth to clear the way, to part the waters for Sula, Song of Solomon, Tar Baby, Jazz, Beloved, and others. The Bluest Eye announced a change not only in African-American lit, but in literature, period, picture this woman walking the dawn home, married to black air. Um, you know, and so, you know, and I go on to talk about other things in a much uh, longer fashion. But one of the things I do talk about as the reason why um, that first book was so important um, is so, because in that first book, that we began to read. Uh, Sister Toni Morrison told us a number of things about ourselves and, and about a uh, uh, people. Um, that she uh, showed us a native daughter, you know, a woman who has moved her blackness or rather her lack of identity to a level never seen uh, in this life, you know, in literature. Um, uh, she tells us about a woman and I had to identify that even before uh, uh, this book came out because I taught Black Lit for so many years. I taught in academe for 45 years. Uh, but one of the things I had to name it so people could understand just how important this was. And what Sister Toni Morrison did is that she also developed what I call a secondary consciousness in her literature. Isn't that amazing about, you know, and so therefore this woman, Pauline Breedlove, you know, uh, you know, developed a secondary consciousness. She began to see, see herself secondarily uh, through the eyes of the people she worked for, just as we developed that through the eyes of our slave masters. Um, and so she would then find legitimacy in being what I call, and Sister Tony called, the perfect servant in a perfect white house that she kept perfect and where she was finally reviewed as a woman of power because she was indispensable to the Fisher family. The butcher, she could call the butcher from the Fisher house and say, that was a terrible rough 
tough roast that you sent us and you must come and pick it up. And they will come and pick it up because she's in a place that is respectable in quotes, whatever. And so therefore she is a woman of power. But you know that when she goes home to where she lives over a store someplace, you know, either in Harlem or any places, you know, uh, places around the country that she could never call the store and say to them, come pick up this roast. It is tough, whatever. So she gives us she gives us something that is so deeply hurtful as you read it that you know that the respectability you know uh comes from being the perfect servant you know whatever uh and so therefore she develops a secondary consciousness she begins to look at her husband secondarily through the eyes of mr fisher because she cannot take care of the family uh that is um uh, one of the things, one of the major things that in understanding our, our soldier in America, she gives us this book to make us understand we, you know, us, you know, we women, you know, what we have gone through, um, you know, also. And that is, what, you know, one of the things that, that, that I think is so important. Um, uh, and I just wanted to, that's much longer, but I just wanted to bring that out. That, uh, that is why that book was so important, you know, that this book, The Bluest Eye, uh, we did a, a reading of that book up at Cornell, uh, a bunch of writers and, mm -hmm. and, and professors at Cornell. It was a beautiful moment. And we took, they gave us sections to read from and each person read it and moved on and commented on it. And you could see the wholeness of this book. And you knew indeed that this first twin had prepared the way because by golly by gee came the lose you know afterwards right and all the work that made us think you know and made us look and begin to see ourselves you know not secondarily whatever you know but primarily yeah yes absolutely i hope that wasn't too long oh that was wonderful and as far as i'm concerned mm -hmm. we haven't even begun to reckon with the, that legacy uh, uh, that Miss Morrison left us. So it's important to to raise her up and to look closely every chance we get. Mm -hmm. So I thank agree. you. I agree. I agree. You know, it is a joy. You know, and 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 many of the people that we know. I've been. I I, I think I've said to you over the telephone. We've had long conversations. You know that for the, the last three or four years, I've been completely disconnected because of all the people I've known, you know, dear friends who've made transition, uh, uh, you know, it, it is almost as if I've been moving in a fog, right, you know, and, and one day I just turned, I was walking out, going to the park, and I just turned and said, for God says, God, leave us, the writers, the poets, these black women, who have told us, you know, who have told us about ourselves, who told us about this country. They have told us exactly some of the things that we've got to change and how we must be, you know. We need them. We need them walking with us, period, whatever. You know, and sometimes, you know, when I'm walking to the park, I'm talking to myself and people pass by and say, Miss Sanchez, I say, yes, I'm talking to myself this morning, right? You know, hallelujah, right? Having know? the conversation. <laughs> Having the conversation, right, yes. An important conversation, I think. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're more Thank than you welcome. Thank you so much. Um, so for the sake of the audience, um, I'm going to pose a couple of questions and they're going to be interspersed as uh, at least from time to time by um, some by re a reading of some little excerpts of an, of an essay that I wrote about Sonia. Okay. It was called Nine Seeds, and it was published in um, Peace is a Haiku Song, a, a booklet, a book, I'm sorry, by the, uh, published by the Mural Arts uh, pro Project of Philadelphia, maybe hmm, some years ago, four or five years ago. Right. And so, it was it was it was uh, original idea as since I was the, the first poet laureate. Yes. Exactly what did I want to do? And I said, but I, what was the first thing you want to do as poet Laura? And I said, I'd love to have a peace mural. So anyone in this audience, if you've never seen the peace mural, go down and see, you know, these haku, uh, you know, done by Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, um, Maya, Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, um, you know, uh, uh, um, 
all, all of these people who've done the piece haku, it's a beautiful mural. Um, and I remember when I called uh, 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 Sister Tony and Sister Maida said, what? haku? I don't write a haku, Sonia. You, you write haku. You and those other poets, I said, I know, but we want peace haku on this wall. So children in Philadelphia, um, adults in Philadelphia, people from all over uh, the world can come in and see the, the peace haku, you know, sit down and look at it, you know, and close their eyes and see and listen and read out loud and, and, and thank them for writing this. And so therefore they did write a beautiful haku uh, uh, for the peace mural because every city needs a peace mural. Uh, what I had envisioned would be from coming from city hall down all the way down Broad Street, uh, maybe about every four or five blocks would be a bench you know, and I got permission from all of them to put their peace mural on benches, right? So people waiting for buses, people tired, you know, people wanted to sit down and rest. They they would sit down and, and turn around and see beautiful, beautiful poetry written by some of our greatest artists, uh, you know, in the park, you know, where we have all of the Amer uh, uh, Philadelphia put up that statue, you know, of that, uh, of that uh, so-called fighter, right? I said, the, what we need to do is that I need to we, we bring a crew, we would paint all the benches that need to be painted, and then we would put on the haku. Can you imagine putting on haku of Sister Toni Morrison, right? You know, uh, uh, you know, all of these people, you know, who took the time to write about peace. And so people coming from all over the world, you know, and who will be sitting on these benches in the park would turn around and see, you know, look yes. at that. Yeah, a haku, you know, there uh, by all these great writers, Alice Walker, you know, all these great, great writers, uh, Sister Maya Angelou, you know, um, uh, Professor John Bracey, who had never written a haku in his life, and who and he attempted to do that. Um, uh, 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 the brother, the rapper, also. Um, why am I blanking on his name? Um, you think uh, it's Talib? No, not Talib. No, he's in the movies. Now, he plays a lot of movie roles now, you know, and, and uh, you know, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've just completely, uh, you know, uh, blank, uh, blank on it, right? Um, um, Common. Yeah. Oh, Brother right. Common. Yes. Brother Common. Yeah, I called him and he said, I definitely would love to do a peace haku. So it, it is something, take your children down to see it, you know, and have a conversation about peace, why peace is so important for not only our cities, but for the world too. That's 15th and Christian, I believe. That's that's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a bit of what I said, and it's gonna lead into a little conversation about the new book. Uh, from that essay, Nine Seeds, I said, launching that harpoon gaze that sweeps, peers, and aches, Sonia must travel in the writer's dawn, eventually sailing forward into words that sprout and peel what we keep quiet. She brings the treasure back. So I always think about you in terms of traveling. Yeah. I always remember that line. It's, uh -huh. I have many keeper lines, but traveling, I am always oh, traveling. That is so true. Uh, from you know, poem. You know, anxiety, I traveled as a child. I was a sleepwalker oh. uh, in Alabama. Yeah, with, with my grandmother, my sister and I shared a room and our room had a, a door, a back door, right? And evidently someone didn't lock the door one night and they came in, my aunties um, came in to check on uh, Pat and, and myself. And I was missing from the bed, um, the lower one. And they found me going down, walking down uh, the alleyway in the back. You know, in the south, how they have the alleyways in the back. Well, and they said they picked me up and brought me back. I never woke up at all. I don't remember it, right. But I was a sleepwalker also. Wow. So wow. Maybe I was always traveling even as a child, right. Wow, <laughs> incredible. Well, on that note, um, when as you think about the, the new book, the collected poems, um, do you envision any particular journey for us readers of that book across the, the decades of those poems? Is there I, any I, kind of 
I journey think we should be. I think it's important um, um, for people to see the type of poetry I was writing in the 60s. We were very angry in the 60s when we started to write, you know, you know, so, you know, we called people names, um, you know, we identified them uh, with some real heavy names at some particular point, because uh, it, imagine um, the young people coming into uh, the information, uh, the reality that they had been enslaved. See, young people, people today have learned about that, but no one taught us about our enslavement. In our classrooms, even in high school, you would just see, they would, they would point out during the history class that uh, Negroes were uh, slaves, whatever. And you have a picture of a, of, of a so-called slave saying, yes, the boss, I love this watermelon. And all the black kids would shrink down in the seats like this. You know, there weren't that many in, in that high school anyway, but at least maybe about four or five of us would just, and wouldn't say a word. We knew there was something wrong, but we couldn't put our finger on it. We come home and we say to, I say to my dad, you know, uh, we were studying about um, uh, the South and there was this picture of, you know, this black, uh, boy, you know, with watermelon up to, oh, and the caption was, oh, I love me some watermelon. And I said, it was terrible. My father, and my father said, oh, don't worry about that, Sonia. You know, don't worry about that. That's not true. You, you're going there to learn. But it did form you, inform you, malform you also in the classroom. You know, that is why some years later, when someone says to me, when, when people from the BSU, brothers came and sisters came from the BSU, they came and we met in a place called Mexico. Uh, uh, they came and said, we want to begin black studies because we've got to change the image that is being given out in the universities and in schools. Right, right, absolutely. So that's so that that's one aspect of the journey, that understanding of the context for black studies, the early poems, the black arts poems. What what other sort of But it wasn't just the context, my dear sister, for black studies. It was like the the, the coming into uh, uh, who you are, who you who who we were. It was in uh, uh, we think the killings are new here. Many young people think that the killings of black men, black boys, uh, black girls is all new black women. Uh, we lived through that already. I lived in Harlem and if there happened to be a fight between um, uh, a black gang and a white gang, the police would collect the black gang and, and evidently beat them. And they would come back around to our neighborhood at about 12 o'clock midnight, you know, all beat up. You know, and you go across the street to say something. They say, "Get away from me! Get away from me!" And the and the parents, the frustration, uh, the inability to do anything about it. Um, uh, I remember that. I remember uh, uh, living that. I remember seeing that. I remember having tears in my eyes um, because we understood at some point that our parents did not have the power to stop that kind of behavior. Whenever these kids, this, these black and white kids, decided to mix it up. You know, and duke it out uh, on the streets of New York City. So that that was very difficult. Um, but but what did happen, however, is that you know we continued to move. You know, we went through when I was at Hunter College. One of the major things that began to happen when I was at Hunter College is that the the the, the young blacks in the South began to do sit-ins, whatever, and we were amazed by that. You know, we were tuned into that constantly. Uh, always looking, always watching what was going on. And, and so when, you know, many of us, uh, uh, you know, finally uh, graduated from, from college, I did it mid-year mid in, in January, uh, my dad said, you got to go get a job. So I answered the ads in the New York Times and the Daily Mirror and the Daily News. And as soon as I got there and people saw me, they said, I'm sorry, the job is filled. And I remember coming home, my dad said, you'll never get a job from those firms downtown. And so he said, but I'm gonna buy a New York Times and you can go and look at those. So I looked at those things and I answered an ad that said they wanted a writer for a firm. Send a copy of your writing, send like a CV, right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad they didn't ask for a picture, right? <laughs> right. And I sent all that and I got a telegram. 
I don't know if the people in the audience today know what about a telegram it. is. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure the young people say, Telegram, what is wrong with her? You know, but it's something that someone would deliver usually on a Saturday, ring the bell, right? You know, and it's in a little yellow, a little yellow envelope, right? And my yellow envelope said, report to work at 9 a.m. with the address. You know, I was hired. I took that envelope. And I put it in front of my father's face. It's a C, 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 C. I can't get a job. And guess what? Something I want to do. Right. I was writing for the firm. And my father said, mm -hmm, yeah, well, you better prepare just to do some teaching. And I got all dressed up on that Monday in my blue suit, my blue hat, my white gloves, my white purse, my blue pumps, and went downtown. And they said 9 o'clock, but I got that 8.30. And I was waiting outside the office because it wasn't open. And this woman, I, the secretary, came tipping down the hall. And she said, yes, can I help you? And I went in my purse, took out the telegram, and said, here. Have you ever had someone read something and then look at you? And then read something again and look back up at you? I'm afraid I have, yes. Look back up at you and, and handed it back to me. She said, come inside. She unlocked the door. I went inside and sat down. I'm sitting there like looking really great, whatever, feeling great, saying, I'm going to get a job writing for the firm. I'm going to get a job writing for the firm. Hooray, hurrah, hooray, 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 or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I saw a face come from one of the doors, and another face came from around another door. And it was, it was about 10 to. And this man comes in and says, yes, can I help you? And I had to him the telegram, you know, and he looked at the telegram and he looked at me. He looked down at the telegram again. He looked back up at me and he did it a third time. And then he said, I'm sorry, the job is taken. I said, oh, oh, using my New York humor. I said, I got it. You said report for work at 9 a.m. I got here at 8.30, you okay? I'm gonna go outside the door, right? <laughs> and I'm going to come back in at 9 a.m. and everything would be fine. And the guy looked at me like, are you crazy? You know, he looked at me and said, I said, the job is taken. You know, there is, you know, I said, but how can it be? I got here before nine o'clock. I got here with my telegram. And he said, I said, I got it. Discrimination. I'm going to report you to the Urban League. And he turned and looked at me and said, lady, I don't care. And he walked out and left. And I remember taking off my hat you know, tears in my eyes. The secretary kept her head down. She never looked up. I went out the door. I got on the subway. And anyone who knows the subway system in New York City knows that if you stay on that uh, express train and don't get off at 96 to stay on the west side, you're going to end up on the east side. And I'm sitting there just bemoaning what had happened to me. And the door closes and I'm on the east side. And I get off finally at 135th Street to go across you know, to oh go across, God. mind you, to get to the Urban League. And all of a sudden, I'm a quarter into the block, and there's a sign that says, the Schomburg. And there's a guy outside doing a quick smoke. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, uh, what is the Schomburg? Imagine, I'm a graduate now of Hunter College, right? OK, get uh, uh, registered for NYU in September, right? Um, I said, what is the Schomburg? He said, go inside, sign your name, and go up the steps, and you'll see. And I came into this big large room with this long long table and nothing but black male scholars were sitting there with books stacked high you know and there was a glass door and I knocked on the glass door and Miss Huston used to tell this story when I brought my classes you know to um uh, the Schomburg uh I she opened the door and I told her my name and she said I said, uh, and who are you? She said, my name is uh, Miss Jean Hudson. I am the curator here. Uh, I'm the head of the Schomburg. And I said, well, what is the Schomburg? She said, oh, my dear. She said, this library has books only by and about Negroes, you know. And I said with my fresh mouth, I said, there must not be many books in here, huh? <laughs> she never, <laughs> ever let, Let you forget that. it. <laughs> Every time I brought a class, she would say, oh, Professor Sanchez always bring a class every semester. But let me tell you a little story about your professor. And she'd tell that story <laughs> and disappear until the, the, the wall, whatever. But uh, th so therefore, she set me down. You know, she made the men make room for me. That, uh, and she set me down. She said, just sit here. I'm going to bring you uh, some books. And I looked at my watch. I thought she had forgotten me because 20 minutes had passed. And all of a sudden, she, she puts down three books, Souls of Black Folk, 
up from slavery and their eyes are watching God. Open their eyes are watching God. It was on top, you know, whatever. And the, the, the eyes and the ears and the head and the tongue had to become accustomed to the black English that that, that was being right. written. You know, it is not dialect, it is black English that, you know, that we, you know, talked uh, in this uh, place called America, right? And I finally got it and I, I read maybe about a fourth of the book and I eased out and I went and knocked on the glass door and I had tears in my eyes and I said, what's your name again? And she said, Miss Huston, I said, um, uh, how could I be a graduate here in New York City, you know, and not, I never read these books. She said, oh, my dear, go sit down. I'm going to give you many, many more books. And I eased my way in and sat down mm -hmm. and, you know, and started to read more. And I, I began to sob actually. And the men around me was so funny. They began to look up at me. They looked at each other. I mean, they were being bothered by this young woman here. Mm -hmm. Right. And I eased up again and I knocked on the door and I was, I was really sobbing, you know, and, and, and I said, but how could I be educated? And I have never read anything like this. She said, oh my dear, I'm going to give you plenty of books. Now go sit down. Well, I got ready to sit down, ease in. And this African scholar said, Miss Hudson, tell this young woman, either she has to sit still or she has to leave. She's bothering us, right? And I sat still for the rest of the summer. Every day I told my Every father, day. I'm going to look for a job downtown <laughs> and I went to the Schomburg and she fed me books and then she sent me to Mr. Michaud and Mr. Richard Moore who had bookstores at 125th Street and right. they gave me bags of books forever and I took them home so when someone said at some point we need somebody who knows something about black lit someone said you know sanchez is always talking about you know uh du bois and and, and thornio hurston and people and langston hughes i mean i don't know those people we should contact they she should be contacted and that's how i was contacted to go and begin teaching something called black literature you know uh um um beginning to come in and, and vowing that no student be you black, white, I don't care, brown, I don't care what color you be, you will not come to a university, you know, and not not see, not taste, you know, the genius of black writers uh, and black scholars, uh, period. Yes. So that's how I got there, right? Wow. Yeah. And that's only the beginning of your oh, journey. Just, just the, the, the <laughs> beginning it was a tough thing because and because I was teaching Du Bois and Frederick Douglass and 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 um, uh, Garvey uh, and Richard Wright, the FBI came to my home one day and knocked on the door with my landlord. My landlord said, Professor Sanchez, these two men would like to see you. And before I could move, they said the two of them stepped in and said, "You're teaching Du Bois, Garvey, you know, Wright, you know." And I said, you know, I was such an innocent. I said, yes, you can't teach black literature without them. You know, I didn't get it, right? And right. They, they looked at me like, duh, you know, don't you get it? You know, no, we don't allow that to happen anymore, whatever, you know, these are seditious people, whatever. We consider, this, and here you are, you young people coming on campus and bringing back these seditious people to people. No, we don't want that to happen at all, right? And it was an amazing moment, you know, uh, for me. And all I could think about is Miss Hudson gave me all these books. You know, I have to call Miss Hudson, right? <laughs> you know, and and I mean, they were. He was the other FBI man stood still as 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 as, 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 as dank water. The other one got in my face again. My landlord left, by the way, you know, and wow. he said, you know, we're going to. You, you, and then he turned and said to my lady, she's one of those, they didn't say militant, it's another word that they used at the time with us. Um, you know, she's one of the militants teaching on campus and, and, and he was just so angry. And you know how when you're in a foreign country and you don't speak the language and they don't speak, you know, English. And so instead of like just talking normally, what you do is that you talk slowly. And I said, yes, I teach black literature. I teach Du Bois, Garvey, mm -hmm. Hughes, mm -hmm. Wright, whatever. And the guy is looking at me like, you know, like whatever, et cetera. 
and there we were. And he screamed again. And someone had given me, uh, in fact, my landlord had given me, because uh, he said, you're here by yourself, had given me this um, amazing Samoyed, uh named Snow. And, and I said to him, I'm not going to keep this dog because I come from New York City. We could barely feed ourselves, much less a dog, you know. And this dog was big, this big white dog with these beautiful eyes. And I heard these big feet come down the hallway. And he came and sat down right next to me and did like this. And I'm saying now, now I have the dog I'm thinking, you know, to contend with, you know, a dog that I only fed, I never pet it, right? And he just sat there. And this man put his hand in my face again and Snow leaped for him. Wow. And he said, lady, lady, watch your dog. And I said, Snow. And he sat down, but he never took his eyes off of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, the two men. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he left, uh, I, I leaned down and petted Snow for the first time and said, you know what? I'm going to get you a steak. You know, uh, we're a house of vegetarians in here. This is a keeper. You probably, you probably need, you know, you probably need, you know, some meat. But I got on the phone and called Miss Hudson. And I got her at the library and I said, I was crying. I said, Miss Hudson, the FBI just came to my house and they were really terrible and, and called me, you know, you know, told my landlord to put me out. Right. And I said, and all I'm doing is teaching black literature and creative writing. She said, oh, I never, I can still hear a word. So, oh, my dear Sonia, I thought you knew that if you taught those people, you might get in a little trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and trouble we got into. Trouble right? and tr but, yeah, truer words. <laughs> but we taught people, we taught classes that were filled, people were sitting together uh, on one seat. They pulled chairs from other rooms to come in and listen. And then the white students heard what was going on and they came in and sat too, you know, mm -hmm. and we had this amazing class when you taught people about, you know, black literature. It was an amazing moment, my dear sister. Yeah. And so important for people to understand that mm -hmm that it has not always been the way it is now in terms of, you know, the resources mm -hmm. and the literature mm -hmm. and the courses mm -hmm. that people can avail themselves of, the, of now. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. How about a poem, Sonia? You feel like uh, it might yeah, be a moment to poem. read something. Uh, yeah, what, would you, what, what poem is, you, is any special poem you'd like me to read? Uh, I should read from the book, I guess, huh? Or yeah, something from the book. I I have a I, I have a sort of um what? you know what? you'll do what you want to do but I'm always interested in the fact that uh, and I've had many a moment where I like a little school teacher moment uh, okay. where people are talking about your work and and uh, there's so much that that people don't know mm -hmm. like there's like there's the the poem at thirty for example you mm -hmm. know that's a classic but there's there's so many poems that like like one of my secret it's not a secret, actually. Personal letter number three right. is, is like a poem I dearly love. And yet, um, most people don't know that poem, I don't well, think. And that's an old poem, I admit. Yeah, those but, are, and that's what we did in this book, my dear sister, right? We would then uh, take poems from Homecoming, my first book, right? You know, and, and there at some point. So I will read poem at 30 and personal letter number two, okay? on page four and 21. So people, and we wanted people to get a sense of, uh, of course, in collected and selected poems, you know, uh, you know, like who we are, uh, you know, what, how we started to write, uh, what we wrote, uh, the kind of uh, poem that we wrote. This is called Poem at 30. It is midnight, no magical bewitching hour for me. I know only that I am here waiting Remembering that once as a child, I walked two miles in my sleep. Did I know then where I was going, traveling? I am always traveling. I want to tell you about me, about nights on a brown couch when I wrap my bones in lint and refuse to move. No one touches me anymore. Father, <clears throat> do not send me out among strangers. You, you, black man, stretching scraping the mold from your body. Here is my hand. I am not afraid of the night. Uh, <coughs> that's a poem at 30. <coughs> mm. 
Anissa Waters. Um, the weather is changing, you know, you can tell. Uh, it's getting a little bit warmer. Yes. And the other poem that, that ends this first book, Homecoming, <laughs> is personal letter number two. I speak skimpily to you about apartments I no longer dwell in and children who chant their disobedience in choruses. If I were young, I would stretch you with my wild words while our nights run soft with hands, but I am what I am, woman alone amid all this noise. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. First book, Homecoming, right? Yes. Yes, the beginning yes. of the series. And, and this is a, a great picture that our, our brother, the poet uh, in, um, um, the poet in, you know, the poet who, who takes pictures of all of- uh, Oh, um, okay. Eugene Redmond? Redmond, uh-huh. Yeah, I needed a picture and I called Eugene and said, please send me a picture, right? And I like to have a picture like what we do, you know, you know, we're on stage either lecturing or reading a poem. So I, it, I, it's a great, great- That's a uh, great photo. Great, it, isn't it? I mean, he's so great, you know, doing those pictures and he sent it right away and, and there it was, right? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Um, well, let's 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 go a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, I I guess I am finding this a little irresistible. Um, this next question, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface the question with another little blurb from this essay uh, that goes like this: Many years ago, I came to visit Sonia and found her standing on her head, a health practice, she <laughs> said, to reorient her blood and eyes to balance and rejuvenate flows, to sight up the low before the high. Later, Sonia began to greet people with palms pressed together, a resonant nod and a muted smile as replacement for the hug, kiss, handshake. The gesture calls for gathering mind, body, and spirit. And that passage made me think about because you've been doing that for years. Right, right. And I, it, that passage made me think about, you know, the practices that have become a lifestyle oh, yeah. uh, now during COVID. Right. And I, I just um, wanted to ask you, do you really thinking about the, really the twin pandemics of COVID and what I call these days, undeniable systemic racism mm -hmm. and how, how, how have they changed the way poems show up in our lives? How poems show up in our lives? Is that what yes. You're yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, my dear sister, you know, um, you know, I've been writing now for a long time. Um, if you read me, if you read Homecoming, uh, it's a a, 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 a real a uh, bad book, if you know what I mean, using the word, right? That the people writing uh, in my time, uh, uh, Baraka, um, Haki, Alice, um, um, Askia. Askia, you know, all the people that way, Larry Neal, uh, um, uh, oh uh, people coming out of Chicago, um, uh, uh, but also Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Walker, you know, all of those people, Dudley Randall. And, and one of the things that, um, that we wrote and the reason why I got the first book Homecoming is that Dudley Randall uh, did, a, did a book called For Malcolm. <laughs> yes. And he sent out word to all the poets to send, right? To send him a poem on Malcolm. And, and that's what I did. And because I sent that poem on Malcolm, uh, you know, uh, and, and that poem began, um, 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 that poem began, um, uh, page nine, that poem began like this, if you remember. Yes, do not I speak do. to me of martyrdom, 
of men who die to be remembered on some pirate say, I don't believe in dying, though I too shall die and violets like castanets will echo me. Yet this man, this dreamer, thick lipped with words will never speak again. And in each winter, when the cold air cracks with frost, I'll breathe his breath and mourn my gun-filled nights. He was the sun that tagged the western sky and melted tiger scholars while they searched for sights. He said, forget you, white man. We have been curled too long. Nothing is sacred now, not your white face, nor any land that separates until some voices squat with spasms. Do not speak to me of living. Life is obscene with crowds of white on black. Death is my pulse. What might have been is not for him or me, but what could have been floods the womb until I drown. And that was an amazing collection for Malcolm that Dudley Randall, you know, yes. uh, edited uh, along with uh, uh, Sister Margaret Burroughs. Um, right. And and because of that, uh, Dudley saw uh, some of what he called the younger poets in there. <clears throat> and he wrote me and said, would you be interested in publishing? I'm going to start a publishing company, uh, Broadside Press. Would you be interested in sending me some of your work? Isn't that amazing? Whatever. Uh, no one was going to publish us or touch us considering some of the things that we were writing because what we were doing, we were writing about what's happening today. When you see the young people in the streets now, when you see mm -hmm. uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, when you see all the young people, the amazing things. Someone said to me, the black and whites and, and, and Latinos, you know, uh, uh, people of color in the streets. But I reminded them that, you know, that was what happened with us also too. It was not always just blacks, you know, because right. when we read in New York City and we read in the village and all over in Long Island, you know, our audience quite often <clears throat> was mostly white. Just as when Malcolm went to speak and, and, and we would follow him around at these universities, there weren't many uh, blacks. And Puerto Ricans in these schools, so you had mostly a white audience there listening to these words and, and the poetry. So it was an amazing moment, you know, uh, for all of us at some particular point. So yes, we began to write about what was happening, what had happened uh, to all of us uh, here in America. And we began to write also about the murders, you know, the killings uh, at some point. And so the language became really uh, uh, um, uh, fast and 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 uh, a rat tat 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 kind of thing, you know. Uh, you know, uh, 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 New Yorkers understood us, but when we went to California to begin Black Studies, and uh, one of the first readings that that well, we gave at San Francisco State, Baraka and I got up on stage and we were reading and I would read first and he would go, yeah. And I, he would read and I'd go, yeah. And we were like from New York City, you know, like, whoa, bad stuff. You know what I mean? You know, bringing it to San Francisco <laughs> and people clapped. And then a hand went up and we said, yes, um, uh, would you, and, and at that time uh, he was Leroy Jones, not Baraka, Mm -hmm. uh, you and Miss, Miss Sanchez, but you and Mr. Jones, would you mind reading that poetry again? Because you read so fast, we couldn't quite understand what you were saying. <laughs> and I remember Baraka looked at me and I looked at him and said, what? Um, and then we read it again and we did it at a slower pace. And you know, the, the, the joy of what rap has done in mm -hmm. America, that every time I would go to the Midwest or to the South, I would control the reading. I would do it at a slower pace sometimes and really sometimes offbeat, you know? Mm -hmm. But rap like hit through America. So any place you go, if you read a poem fastly fast, they got it, you know, uh, where yeah. you are, you know, in California, Midwest, you know, in the South, whatever. So therefore we understand how that, you know, how that, what, what that was all about. And so we read it again and, and there we were, but you know, it, it was a different kind of, of motion and movement out in California. But um, what, uh, what what we did there at San Francisco State and the BSU was the leading force there along with Nathan Hare, uh, you know, beginning to bring, you know, I taught 
uh, uh, black literature for the first time on that campus, right? You know, uh, I taught uh, 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 creative writing and Kay Ball, one of the famous writers from Hemingway's time came in and sat in and she wrote um, The Long Walk of San Francisco State. And she wrote at the beginning, it was something to see uh, Sonia Sanchez teaching a class of people of color. And they felt it was okay to write about themselves because they had been told in the class, they said, don't, you, no, no, we don't wanna hear about you. We don't wanna hear about your father, you know, and, and something that he did, or your father went down to get a job and he didn't get it. Or some man patted your father on the head, which happened to my father and he bristled, right? Whatever, mm -hmm. and came home and slammed the door. You knew something was wrong. And I did a, 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 a piece about that. And my creative writing teacher at Hunter said, I, no, 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 write something funny. You know, you know, write something funny. Uh, uh, don't write that, you know, uh, write something funny. Isn't that something? And by the time I left that class, I was like, you know, um, I wrote about uh, sitting in front of a mirror in my bedroom and a, 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 a face came out and began to talk to me. I just stopped writing what I was writing at that point. Mm -hmm. And it was not until I got into grad school that I was, I looked in, I was looking in the book and there was a class, creative writing poetry mm -hmm. um, um, um uh, what's her name why am i forgetting her name um Bogan. louise Bogan. Bogan. louise Bogan um was teaching it and i said don't register go and see you know what's happening because i had been in a number of workshops before Bogan's workshop at nyu and i would go and i would go i went into a sea of whiteness right and and no white females Right, just all white males. And I was the only black and the only female. And I raised my hand to say something and it was said and it just dropped there. Nobody responded at all. And so, you know, after two or three sessions, you, you, you know, you left. Um, and a side story, and remind me where I left off, but in a side story, some years later, uh, two of the people who taught those workshops that I left, um, you know, there was, there were, we had these great demonstrations on Vietnam, the Vietnam War, right? Yes. And one of the professors, I never forget it, came up to me and said, you're Sonia Sanchez, and I'm the one who sent you the letter, right? And said, oh, we're so happy to have you here. We just want to hear what poem you've written about the war. It's a joy. And he just hugged me. And the person with me is a famous writer. She said, Sonia, why didn't you curse that guy out? I mean, that, I mean, I, I you know you you told me the story about how no one ever responded to you, you know, and you had to drop these classes. And I said, my dear sister, what you don't understand is that people can change. Mm -hmm. That's what we're fighting for, you know, for people to change, whatever, you know. And right. what would it do me twenty years later? right or right. 10 years later to jump up and say do you know what you did to me whatever i smiled and thanked him for the invite whatever and, and did and this is what i'm talking about at some point you know so in this book you know you see us these young people writing you know cursing out america you know you right. know uh, for not telling us about that we were enslaved you know for all the damage that they had done us you know in terms of our psyches right whatever you know uh going through classes and never the only time you saw yourself in a history class was someone eating a watermelon whatever said you were a slave right you know and in a source class they had like these tall buildings you know but little rats running through mazes and we knew we were the rats running through those mazes in those high buildings that they were building for us in New York and around the world. Um, you know, so, you know, so at some point, you know, but you, you, you move, you know, you, you move on, you know, you, you, you understand at some point that it wasn't everybody doing that, you know, it, it was the government doing that. It was, you know, the presidents doing that. It was the Democratic and Republican Party doing that, you know, it was the schools that did that, the ones who did not teach us anything about uh, being black in America, you know, uh, uh, that they held us in contempt, some of those teachers. One teacher walked in, she was a substitute, and she looked at the boys and said, I don't know why I'm going to try to teach you anything because you're just going to end up in jail. Wow. You know? And we froze and looked at the girls and said, well, I don't know why I'm going to try to teach you anything. You're just going to have a ba have babies, end up with babies. Can you imagine, you know, you know, and so therefore you understand then the push 
for education, the push for black studies, uh, uh, the push to begin to teach people, you know, uh, you know, uh, words and 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 poetry and stories, well chosen for them to read, so they began to taste their humanity, to taste that they were indeed human beings and not these people, you know, who were just at some point laughed at at and and people going ooga booga 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 booga, you know, when you're in a classroom, yeah. Sonia, when, when you talked about language, that leads me to um, a question from the audience. Um, someone um, raised a question about uh, the fact that, it, and it's specifically tying it to Philadelphia, that in the 90s and into the early 2000s, there was a, a, a vibrant spoken word scene mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Right. And and um, the, the the person asking the question uh, feels that cites that seems to see that that has waned, and wondered if you have a perspective on why that kind of activity has waned in the city of Philadelphia. Around, yeah, well, the I think it's waned all. I think it's waned all all over. You know, I think that at some point people understand the importance of poetry, that how it does. And on many levels, and the spoken word and poetry, how it does influence people, it influenced them uh, uh, towards activism. And you know, mm. you and I understand truly that with some of the people we've had, you know, along the way, that they don't want this to happen at all. And also in Philadelphia, many of the people who were involved with poetry, you know, got jobs, left the city, went other places, went to New York, went to California, whatever, went to D.C., you know, went to Atlanta, and so a lot of that. But you know, uh, we still do the poetry uh, a scene uh, in Philadelphia. It's not as as loud as it was before because a lot of the people, as I said, left the city. Uh, but you still have the poetry sessions. You know, Larry Robbins kept it up. You know, uh, uh, our dear sister who who took over the uh, over at uh, the church, Church of the Advocate, uh, Ray right? Carrie. Yeah, yeah. There we were, you know, uh, we, we had some amazing poetry. We had some Sundays when they organized people to come in uh, with classical music, you know, to play classical music. And I read uh, my haku to that. So if people had to look in the paper to find out or call these places, whatever, but poetry is still alive in, in Philadelphia. Um, yeah. you, know, you have to look for it, you have to hunt for it, you know, uh, and you also, um, as I always say, if you don't see it, my dear sister or brother, whoever you were, demand it, right? You know, you know, you know, go. Well, that's what we did. You know, I, I read poetry in the streets with 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 these these young uh, children who made sure that a plaque was put up uh, where move happened, right? So I went to read some poetry. Can you imagine young school children, right? You know, demanding that they put up a plaque, you know, to identify where move happened. Isn't that amazing? You yes. Know? So when, when, when they invited me to come, I came with a poem, you know, I came to say, so yes, uh, do what we did. When we started to, to, to write poetry, there were no places, we read in the darndest places. I mean, we went into uh, the bottom of churches, whatever, said, who didn't, didn't want us there. They would say, well then, don't you curse, you know, whatever, and leave us there, you know. We went to people's homes, whatever. Yes. You know? We had Saturday night things, whatever. Um, you know, what we should do is that we can't sit back and observe what is not, but that's what we did. But when we saw it was not, we went out, you know, and made the time, you know, we made the things happen, you know, that is a role that we must have, you know, we must at some point make this happen again, make this another city where poetry lives, okay, you know, where we teach young people poetry. Uh, I did the workshop at, um, at, the, at the, not the, li the library when I first came here, right, but also at the, the museum, the, the African American Museum here, and the YMHA, uh, I did workshops when I came. I taught at Temple, but I know that there are people who cannot afford college. And so I did workshops. And I think some of y'all came to the workshop at, um, at the museum, the African American Museum. I walked into a workshop and boom, you know, there were 40 people sitting there uh, who wanted to be taught. Isn't that amazing? And yes, every absolutely. Poet, poet in the day, you know, I, I taught in that workshop. 
It was amazing workshops. And that's what we do. We have to do that. Um, uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm what, I'm 85 now? Is it, is it 86? Uh, I think so. Now. <laughs> and, you know, so I'm not going to do too many workshops anymore. So right. it's been upon many of you all to do the workshops, do what we did. You know, mm -hmm. we did workshops in our homes. You know, I don't know how yeah. safe that is. We can't do that now, At you know, but you can do workshops outside in the park the way we used to do, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, when we come past this pandemic, you know, go start a workshop, you know, have people, you know, that quite often, you know, I said, if we're writing books at this time, come on, people, I had people come meet on my porch, in my backyard, whatever, you know, and it didn't matter, you know, if you have published or how much you've published, but let's sit and listen to each other's work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that we can do. If you go to church, demand the church. You know, have the downstairs have you allow you to, to do a poetry workshop there? Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, this is what you have to do to make yeah. sure it happens. Agency. That's right. Sonia, we have time for one more question, and it's hard to choose. There's many good ones in the in the queue, but um, someone asked. Um, speaking of you know teaching and reading in together, what uh, uh, can you talk about any of the poets that you? at this moment that you uh, feel are carrying on in the tradition of the Black Arts Movement and, you know, in some of the other literary traditions that you've been a part of, people oh, that you okay. feel are important yes. to uh, the, uh, the woman talk about. That, 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 you know, they read Joy Harjo, you know, uh, who is now the Poet Laureate, right? Uh, yes. I mean, I mean, just an amazing, amazing Alice, Alice Walker, you know, um, are still poeting here in Philadelphia. You, my dear sister, my dear sister, the two poets who live up the street from here, right? You know, help me. You know, I mean, just every now and then I just Yolanda Wisher, Yolanda, right? Peter and, Mason and uh, May, yeah, yes, and Ursula Rucker. Ursula Rucker. I mean, but in fact, someone, um, uh, um, the, one of the bookstores, the new bookstores. Um, um, you know, did and, and quotes um, a, a shirt with the four of us on there uh, together, right? So what, what are we saying? Uh, yeah, um, uh, there, are, there, there are people, you know, who are still poeting. Uh, they're still doing the work. Um, uh, I, I say to all of you that uh, if you, what we did at the very beginning when we finished studying with Louis Bogan, where I published my first part, three of my poems for the first time in that workshop of 45 people. I mean, it was utterly amazing. And, you know, 45 people in a That's workshop. That's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's NYU. You know what I mean? They're not going to put them out, whatever, right? Yeah. People paying for it, right? You come in. I was the only Black, and there was only one other woman in that workshop, a sea of men, whatever, et cetera. And, uh, and she taught us, you know, form, you know, and I always tell, you know, when you come to my class, I teach you form too, because I said form will not deform you, <laughs> right, whatever. But it will teach you that you're dealing with, you know, free verse, you know, blank verse, uh, a villanelle, you know, a haku, whatever. And if you say you're a poet, you should know those forms at some particular point. You know, it is that kind of reality that, that, that we dealt with. And I tell you, my dear sister, um, you know, it is, uh, you, know, you know, utterly amazing I mean, utterly amazing. What's wrong? Utterly amazing um, uh, that 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 this is what you know. Uh, no, I did. Uh, we did. Uh, we said, okay, you want to write? Let's get a workshop together. You know. So I came to the museum. I came to the YMHA. Right in New York City, I I did a workshop. Um, you know, at the Counter Cutting Library, and and many of the major writers came out of that workshop, and I did it every. Wednesday, you know, and they they used to have to put us out. The the men said we got to go home, you know. At eleven o'clock, we were still sitting in there, and that was amazing. So yeah, uh, you know, what I'm saying simply at some point, um, uh, there are fantastic writers. Um, uh, and I, if I know you want to ask that question, I would have had my litany of names. Um, um, you know, but people in Brooklyn, some fantastic writers in Brooklyn, um, uh, uh, people that I have done intros for, 
I just cannot call, recall their names, but they are amazing writers who are writing today. Um, and and Haki Madabuti is writing today. He's still writing poetry today. I mean, there are people who are writing, if I've done introductions to and for, that they live in Detroit, they live in Chicago, they live in Philadelphia, you know, they live in Atlanta, uh, you know, they live all over this country and they are writing young poets, you know, saying some things that need to be said, right? You know, all the poets still poeting, whatever, you know, they are still poeting, they're still saying the words that need to be said. And I like the balance, you know, um, uh, Talib is, 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 is publishing his poetry. Uh, you know, all of these people, the sister in, in, in Detroit also is now publishing, uh, a has published a collection of her poetry. So what I'm saying at some point, I've seen them develop from just being getting up, reading poetry from a notebook to moving to publishing a book. I saw you also, and I read with you and introduced you when you came with your new book uh, also. So I'm saying simply in, in, in the city of Philadelphia, there are some amazing poets who are poeting here, but all over the city, the country, they are poeting and they are distinguished people. Uh, and of course the young sister, right? You know, who did what, did that fantastic- Amanda poem. Gorman. Yes, yes. Sister Gorman gave, did that fantastic poem, you know, at that inauguration. Uh, uh, I met her about two or three years ago when I went down to DC and she introduced me and she read a poem, all right? And I know we, did the elbow to elbow and I bowed to her and said, my dear sister, thank you so very much. You are a fine young poet. This is what we do. We encourage, you know, we read. Uh, I get manuscripts in so often, you know, and I don't even solicit them, right? They just, they just appear uh, here. But the point is simply that, you know, you try to answer, you try to, to help, you try to tell people and you send books. I send books to people because if you are a writer, you must read. You must read every poet poeting who has poeted, you know, whatever, you know, you must read, go back and read Hughes, you know, you must go back and you must read Neruda and Nicholas Guillen. You must read all these great poets, right, who are poeting on this earth, whatever, because they've had something to say uh, about this earth, about what it means to walk upright as human beings. And I've been privileged to be a part of, of, of these poets, but Larry Neal and, and Baraka, you know, uh, and the Chicago poets, um, you know, to be with them, to walk with them, to laugh with them, to tear up an auditorium, whatever, you know, to go to San Francisco and, and Ed Bullens and, and all of us be on stage and some people down front, we had about 12 people at the center, right? Listen to us read poetry. And one of them said, what are they doing on stage? And another one said, I think they're reading poetry. Oh, I thought they was gonna sing and they got up and left, right? <laughs> one year later, one year later at that big place where all the music goes on in uh, the Fillmore, Fillmore, the mm -hmm. Fillmore, right? Yes. We had thousands of people leaning over balconies, the same people, Bullens, Baraka, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, 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 geez, yeah. Yeah. all of these people uh, reading um, Sarah Fabio, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, Marvin X, whatever. We read the, 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 it went from here to here to here. The place got nausea and nausea and clapping, whatever. And by the time we finished reading, there was this huge explosion and we knew that poetry was very real. Poetry was very meaningful and very important because those people stood up and stamped their feet, you know, and the one word that I always turn around and said is as a resist, resist. Because if you write this poetry, you know, you help people to resist, you know, the things that are happening to us. You help people to move through this pandemic. You help people to be quieter than they are. You help people, you know, move and say, this too shall pass. We help people say, I'm going to learn from this. You know, I'm going to learn from four years of someone else who did not talk about humanity, that I'm going to make sure that we continue to walk upright as human beings on this earth. That's what that is all about, my dear sister. You see, this thing called poetry, this thing called poetry that makes us human, you know, yes. it keeps us human, you know, it keeps us beginning, 
always to talk about what it means to walk upright as a human being. Thank you so much, Sonia. I think that's a perfect stopping point with the image of that huge crowd stomping their feet and the image of mm -hmm. poetry as a human endeavor and a humanizing endeavor. Thank you, thank you, my dear. So uh, thank you very much. I want to thank, uh, the thank you too. <laughs> to all the wonderful audience members. Sorry we couldn't enter engage all of your questions, but actually I was checking and some of them were answered along the way. So okay. we did our thing. Thank you for Go coming. Go out and buy collected poems, everybody. Oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do, okay? Uh, support poets, you know. Um, Absolutely. Because at this stage of the game, the thing that I remember when 9-11 happened and a couple of editors called me and what did they say? They didn't say, Sonia, what play should we read? What novel should we read, right? What essay should we read? They said, what poems should we read to get through this? And I say the same to you. What poems should we read to get through this pandemic, right? You know, and let us turn out the poems that will help us get through this pandemic, but also this pandemic of racism that is at some point following us at this particular point. Yes. Much love to all of you. Much love. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. As ever. Good night.